All right, and we are live. Okay, welcome back to uh, Liquidity Provider Insights uh, by Sommelier. Uh, we are sommelier.finance. And if you don't know sommelier.finance, Sommelier is the co-processor for Ethereum. And you can find us at sommelier.finance or join our uh, telegram at t.me slash get S-O-M-M. That's G-E-T. S O M M. You need to get some, and uh, this is uh, June fourteenth. And what we are, of course, ha uh, here with uh, Zaki Mannion, our co-founder and leader of Sommelier Finance. Hi, Zaki. Morning. Morning. All right. And uh, we're going to talk about two big topics today. Uh, one, we're going to talk about uh, what we learned last week from seeing some of our partners in the space uh, in the automated. Uniswap management space. And then I'm going to ask you about, you know, uh, talk about gas prices and L2s and what's happening now that uh, we have cheap gas and, and all this other exciting stuff. But let's jump in and talk about last week. Last week was great. We You hosted Charm Finance. Yeah, on it was great Sunday. talking to them. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, we are, you know, there's, what, there's one way to think of this is we're all competing teams trying to capture the Uniswap V3 balance, rebalancing my Mindshare, but it's really we're all uh, writing open source code and learning together at the same time. Uh, yeah. And that is the spirit of DeFi. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think there is a real, um, you know, this is this is this is like sort of the great. It is a real. It is like a. It is a technical challenge, right? How do how do how do you build one of these rebalancers? Um, right. And I think we're you know we're in we're in the early stages of it, and we've started to see. Um, some rebalancers which have a lot of on on ethereum chain logic um yeah. uh you know uh starting to launch which is you know one approach um yep. but an approach that i think is going to be not necessarily easy to succeed with um yeah. but uh and and so we're, we're taking this validator set co-processor approach to building what we're building um but we're starting to see what sort of the core technical challenges um yep with with rebalancing, which is um, if you just chase the price uh, naively, um, you're constantly buying high and selling low, um, and uh, that is not a successful trading strategy. Um, mm -hmm. And so, what we're starting to see is is folks like Charm uh, trying to figure out, hey, can we have some can we have some limit orders um, that are out there with some of our capital, you know, to 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 buy us back in as the price moves. Um, yeah. So we're all not always uh, selling high and buying low, um, and we get to buy low sometimes to sort of offset that. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that was, I think it's a really interesting approach. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, definitely. Charm uses keepers, right? And and I was curious, would you say that keepers, um, the substitute for keepers is the validator set, and and really um, that is the core differentiator when you think about. So the, the, the core differentiator there is like so if you want to if you want to have a minimally trusted keeper. Right. Yeah. It means that you're using on-chain data for for everything about your position. Um, uh, you're tracking the the how the price is moving from the Uniswap B3 Oracle, um, and you know all the keeper is doing is is doing the job of of moving the positions on an ongoing basis. Um, and I'm starting, I'm, I'm inclined to believe that um, a given vault strategy is gonna have to evolve over time. Um, and so in the keeper world, it's like, we, you have this keeper, this vault's not profitable. You know, you have this vault, it's not profitable anymore. The end user then has to move into the into the new, more profitable vault. Um, I I think there's a realm, a room in this for a little bit more of a, of a, of a, of a, a strategy with more discretion uh, and then using the validator set um, to sort of manage and distribute that discretion. So it's not all sitting in one centralized party. Uh, instead, you have these evolving set of validators who are who are who are who are going to evolve the vault strategy over time. Um, you know, in a market that's bounded and sideways, uh, uh, one way of allocating liquidity is going to work. Uh, in a market that's suddenly moving, you know, up, you have an, you have another or down. You have uh, new strategies that's going to work. And, um, you know, I think the, the, you know, the sort of the difference between the parts of the design space um, that were is, is, you know, it's basically how much flexibility do we build into these vaults 
Uh, if you build too much flexibility, um, you know, you, you end up in this like very centralized thing where you're basically managing other people's money. Um, if you build in too little flexibility, uh, the vault can get wrecked by changing market conditions. Um, and, uh, you know, these vaults, I think, inherently have this, have, have, have quite a, you know, uh, a real risk of loss. Um, not in terms of people stealing your money, but in terms of just a trading strategy that turns out poorly. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think we're all just starting to gain experience with this. And it's, 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 it's very exciting early days. Um, what we are really working on right now is uh, a single validator version of sellers, uh, which is our vault, getting that out into the world, you know, sometime within the next couple of weeks um, and starting to build some more experience with, uh, with, with, you know, managing these positions. Um, I think the other thing is going is, is, is also is like, I think every pair is going to have its, uh, its unique characteristics as well. And I think that's also going to be a big piece of, of how this gets built out. You know, it's interesting you say that, and and it's interesting you talk about you know the limitations of keeper keepers. One of the things I was going to ask you is, it seems that sommelier, um, in your vision, validators have both um, an execution function, but as well as a computation function. Yeah. Um, uh, whereas keepers don't really have a computation function, right? They're they're really yeah. just execute. Do you think that you know if you were to look at that as a differentiator between on-chain Ethereum strategies or others, um, do you think it's a big one or or is it just a small differentiator? Nothing nothing that LPs should be too concerned about. I think it's a big differentiator. I think it's gonna make a huge difference. Um, um, you know, because like, who's the real, who are you really competing against? Who you're really competing against is a fund, um, right. which can do as much computation as they want off-chain and look at all the data sources that they want that are off-chain. They're not, you know, only limited to, we can look at this one price oracle. They can look at prices across numerous centralized exchanges. They look, can look at order flow. I think that's where this is going, right? Um, and so this is, again, the validator set, you know, can do the same kinds of things, uh, you know, compute over exchange over order flow, like centralized exchange over order flow, compute over uh, uh, larger amounts of data, uh, look with, you know, a lot of precision and sort of say, Hey, this is where our liquidity is going to go, um, uh, but it is it is you know it is a little bit it is a it is a hairier design. So so you're saying that in in a sommelier world, LPs really pay fees to have validators both execute and also make the best choice uh, out of a series of choices. Whereas in the keeper only world, you're just paying for somebody to execute, and then you still need to depend on the authors of the protocol to design you know you know they to be incentivized to design the best. And, and the authors of the protocol are at a pretty significant competitive disadvantage against um, a fund. You know, right, that's, exactly. Go um, ahead. So, you know, we're trying, we are trying with Sommelier to, uh, to cut that in, you know, to be, provide more of the capabilities through the validator set that a fund might be able to participate. But it's hard, right. you know, right. no doubt about it. Right, right. Easiest um, thing to do would just be to start a fund. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things, you know, I was curious about your thoughts for LPs is, you know, a lot of LPs have seen economic attacks against uh, farms and um, protocols that do a lot of aggregation. Um, you know, in the sommelier world, um, you know, how does, you know, the LP look at, you know, the possibility of, you know, um, you know, aggregating and, and all these, you know, putting all your tokens together with other folks and then, Making sure that you know you're protected, or or it's not, uh, you know, sort of, you know, dark forest scary. Um, I mean, of course, I know some million contracts will be audited. You know, just like everybody else's contracts will be audited. Any thoughts you have about security? You know, for that, you know, in a in a sommelier world versus say, you know, an on-chain uh, keeper world. Um. I, you know, in theory, um, the the validator world is going to be tougher to economically attack. You have unbonding periods. You know, you can't immediately. You can't just like flash loan a price oracle, right? Right. Um, right. You know, and you know, like one of the, one of the challenges I think that is going to occur with uh, with this again is like, how do you offer a product um, 
in a in the long tail of of assets rather than just like you know the you know the the very liquid USDC ETH, which is pretty hard to manipulate. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I think I think that there is there is definitely going to be an adversarial component of this where you know um, people are going to try to trick. Um, uh, 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 liquidity providers into moving funds in predictable ways, and then you know, just opportunities to extract MEV, like all of yeah. these things. Yeah. Like there is yeah. an attack surface area that is is, is interesting, right. exciting. Uh, right. All I can say is we're 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 thinking about it. Uh, yeah, so yeah, we're we're thinking about it. Understood. All right, so let's talk about um, you know a little bit of what happened last week in the overall DeFi space, moving from you know DeFi automation on Uniswap now to the broader ecosystem gas prices were pretty low uh yeah. we saw 13 gray 19 gray transactions what happened zucky why is it that lp suddenly got a free ride on the l1s after arbitrum and others were <laughs> announcing launches on l2s uh, well i mean the no users have been really onboarded onto l2s um yeah l2s are, are sort of in the I middle know, of polygon's launch. doing well polygon's but, doing well, good. well but it, it depends whether or not you call polygon an l2 okay. polygon is polygon. it's an l1 okay. Um, Polygon is 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 an ETH affiliated L1 in my right. uh, definition with a with a bridge that gets heavily used, um, and the uh, the uh, you know powered by Cosmos and Tendermint, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but you know one of the things one of the things that I think is just will be will be good for the growth of this space is you know. Block space isn't exactly fungible, but like, you know, if there are more places where you can transact and do a transaction that you want um, and more opportunities to carve up the market, there's going to be, you know, everybody, you know, this is the cosmos vision of, of scaling, right? Mm -hmm. uh, application specific blockchains. Uh, right. And so you're going to see different applications gravitate towards Polygon, different allocate applications propagate to Solana, uh, Different applications, you know, uh, various Cosmos chains, um, and and all the L2s and are going to be in the same boat, you know, with 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 applications sort of leading the way and bringing their ecosystems to it. You know, Aave has you know brought an enormous amount of their application ecosystem uh, right. to Polygon. Um, you have you know uh, uh, various other Polygon uh, uh, okay. sort of centric apps like Slingshot, etc., um, showing up. Has, uh Something on Polygon too, right? Is it yep, Curve, Curve's there, Sushi Swap is there, um, uh, you know. And so it's like not exactly application centric, but like you know, there's certain things that are just not there, like Maker's not there, you know, uh, Compound isn't there, um, and so you know, again, the the ecosystem partitions, um, and that's not necessarily uh, the end of the world. Um, it, we can get quite far this way, um, mm -hmm. and so. You know, this is the this is DeFi Summer 2.0 is kicking up, uh, Interchain Edition, uh, right? And hopefully, hopefully this uh, will, on the whole, sort of smooth the rise in gas prices, and L2s will get more mature, and it'll be a good place. Uh, I, I was learning that um, flashbots are now being broad, more broadly used, um, and uh, are possibly a cause for the lowering of gas prices. Uh, any of thoughts of, of yours that LP should consider when thinking about flashbots or? Well, I, I think a bunch of things that are, are really, really good. Um, one is, um, you know, everyone fighting it out in the in the gap in the mempool. Like the worst experience for users is um, everyone fighting it out in the mempool for block space. Mm -hmm. um, and a bunch of and like you know you know a user who might not care. If their transaction completes in the next hour or two, competing with ARBs that are like you know for the next block, um, and Flashbots has kind of moved these into two kind of two distinct markets. Um, the other piece that's happened is is you know uh, a lot of the you know one inch and other aggregators are starting to support Flashbots directly. Um, yeah. The users are again going directly into Flashbots and not going into the into the the mempool battlegrounds. Um, right. And again, this is this is a maturing of the of the blockchain architecture um, mm -hmm. that you know uh, uh, you know it generally makes applications less confused um, about okay. about what what gas prices users should be using. And and 
you know, just for folks who may not understand what flashbots are, um, because we jumped into it, uh, well, how would you define flashbots? Um, flashbots are basically an alternative mempool um, that users can submit to, um, where transactions are bundled together. Uh, so rather than each individual, you know, actually, you know, what you do to with flashbots is you don't even submit transactions; you submit contract calls. Um, you and contract calls contract. Are, are are ordered together. Huh? Mm -hmm. You you uh, said it fast. You submit contract contract calls. Mm -hmm. um, and so contract calls are ordered together, um, and then you also sort of uh, uh, have a payout, a tip, uh, a bribe uh, to the miner who includes it. Uh, so you're completely outside of the gas price market. You're not competing for how much you're going to do. Way you're saying like, here's a whole sequence of contract calls. Here's how much money I make. Here's how much money the miner is willing to get paid. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of it, it takes you out of this context of sort of um, not being economically aware. It makes the mempool sort of aware of the underlying economics of what's going on. So right. you know, frequently you know, there's enough MEV. Uh, in your, you know, in a typical swap or trade, uh, uh, you know, for that to get included without even having to pay a transaction fee. Um, right. And so, you know, again, like you know, kudos to Flashbots. Flashbots uh, is is such a uh, exciting development in the space. Um, and yeah, uh, a lot of a lot of the a lot of the high gas price environment has just been coming from um, uh, users. Um, not having the right tools to use. Um, and mm -hmm. so tools get better, um, gas prices go down. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, there's some inherent limit. Like if everybody wants to trade here, gas prices have to be higher. Um, but, uh, 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 you know, it doesn't necessarily follow that, you know, as you design, like the design of the underlying software can have a pretty big difference on whether or not you're paying, you could be, you know, paying 2X, 5X, 10X, what is actually inherently necessary. Uh, given the raw demand for the chain. That's excellent. And I think, uh, I think you know, if you were to, you know, say to LPs what they should expect from the gas market prices in the coming weeks, do you have any views on, on what, what LP should expect? Will prices continue to be this low or, or is this just a lull before the next run up? I think it's a little bit of a lull. Um, I wouldn't say that the that the you know block spaces become fully fungible or all or like the L2 ecosystem. So you know if if there are exciting trades to be made, people mm -hmm. people will still want you know to to settle on the L1. Um, a lot of derivatives, a lot of products are just still only available on Ethereum L1, uh, and so uh, that will be where where people will go to get their products. But you know. Um, uh, you know, people may not be sometimes too picky about what they farm, and you know, they might, and as 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 yields and returns start to show up on other chains, um, people will go, "Hey, I'm just going to go farm on Osmosis or Solana or uh, or Polygon, and uh, you know, don't need to transact on 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 ETH L1." And people who really want those products that are only available on the ETH L1 will be there, um, and uh, so you know. It is a, you know, my, my mental model of this has always been what we are building is a marketplace for secure, fault tolerant computation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, there there are many places that can serve that demand. Um, and it doesn't all have to, you know, sit on one chain. Um, so that, that ought to, you know, prevent such a, an explosion of gas prices. But, you know, liquidation days are still going to be brutal. Got it. Got it. Um, uh, last and final question for the day, um, sommelier sellers, it's an exciting concept folks are hearing about. Any sneak peeks into uh, what's coming and what LP should be, keep a heads on to see what you might announce in the future? You know, the, the, the seller contracts are out in the open, They're, you know, we're, we're working on it and, you know, we're working on, uh, uh, we're working on uh, a single validator implementation that's being built in Rust um, nice. uh, to, uh, to sort of, um, to sort of start, you know, getting some experience with it. And so hopefully, you know, I'm hoping to have, you know, within the next two weeks on mainnet, a small seller, you know, I'm not reading, encouraging anyone to put their money in. It's on, it's going to be unaudited code and early strategies. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll be out there trying to make some money. 
That's exciting. I can't wait to see it. And uh, hopefully we can cover it our next uh, one of these upcoming uh, LPMA insights. Zucky, thanks for another rocking week of insights for liquidity providers. And again, this is Samilia.finance. Come on down, join our community. If you're a liquidity provider putting liquidity into Ethereum, we're here to help make it faster and easier via our appearance product and our upcoming sellers. Thanks, Zucky. See you next Thank week. Thank you. All right, bye.